When Christianity began, it was distinctively Hebrew. The Hebrews had been, since the days of Abraham, God's select, chosen people. It was through them that his divine plan unfolded. Jesus, in the flesh, was a Hebrew. His ministry had been primarily to the Hebrews. His chosen apostles were all Hebrews, and his church, at least up to this point in the book of Acts, was decidedly Hebrew. While on earth, Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 16, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they shall become one flock. There was certainly the bitter prejudice of the Jews against the Gentiles that had been centuries old, had been going on century after century. And years had just widened that chasm between the two. Jews and Gentiles just didn't seem to get along. But it was God's eternal purpose. His eternal purpose was to reconcile the two together. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and read with me, beginning in verse 11. Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that in himself... He might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. God was going to reconcile all people, and reconcile the Jews and Gentiles, bring them together in Christ Jesus. That is the eternal purpose, that is the eternal plan of God brought about through Jesus' death and resurrection and bringing about the church, the kingdom of God on earth. When you think about the greatest, the last commission that Jesus delivered to his apostles, what was it? To go into all the world, to preach to all creation. And only moments before he ascended in Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, he told his apostles this, that he wanted them to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Peter, when he was preaching in Acts chapter 2, this, this great sermon, all the other disciples, all the other apostles are preaching as well, but we have his sermon, his words recorded for us. And what does he say? That this promise that he's promising them is not just for the Jews at that time. It's also for their descendants. And it's not just for your descendants, but it's also for the Gentile, for all who are far off. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 39. However, it's been about eight years when you come down to Acts chapter 10. And there's really not a whole lot of Gentiles in the church. It's still decidedly Hebrew. See, even though the disciples of Jesus at that time accepted him as the Christ, accepted him as the Messiah, accepted him as the Son of God, they still failed to see the full implications 
of accepting Jesus and following him as their Lord and Savior and what it all meant. They were fine if it was just them and Jesus and their and the Hebrews and the Jews. We're, we're all good. We're all in this. We're, we are God's select people. And it took God to intervene to help push them forward to do what he had planned to do from the very beginning, to help his disciples see that it's not just the Jews, but the Gentiles too need to come to me. They need to be reconciled to me and they need to be reconciled to you. You are all my people. And so as we go back to Acts chapter 10, we're going to see a number of things in regards to uh, what happens with Peter who preached that sermon at Pentecost, but has still yet to really accept Gentiles and is still struggling with that. We're going to see a Gentile who is truly seeking salvation. And so we begin in Acts chapter 10 and verse 1, where we're introduced to this Gentile by the name of Cornelius. He was in need of the gospel. But I want you to consider his character, who this man was. Number one, he was responsible. He was a centurion. He was in charge of a hundred men. He had authority. He, was, he had not just authority, but Roman authority, the government ruling at the time. He was devout. He was religious. He was faithful. He was striving to do what God wanted him to do. He set God as his priority. He feared God. And he did this with his whole house, with all of his house. It tells us that he's a great spiritual leader too, doesn't it? Reminds us of Joshua in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. You can go serve the, the idols and the gods over the river, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Cornelius was one who said, I'm going to serve the Lord and my house is going to serve the Lord. He was full of compassion. He was someone who gave alms regularly. He was a generous man. And he prayed always. And it's during one of these times in which he prays that an angel comes to him and brings him a message. In Acts chapter 10, verse 3. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some, dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon whose house is by the sea. When the angel was speaking to him, had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, I want you to think about this man. We talked about his character. We talked about who he was and, and the way in which he approached God the way in which he wanted to serve God, the fact that he was someone who helped those who were in need, someone who had the respect of not only his own house, but the respect of his soldiers and the respect of the Jews even. And he's praying to God. God hears his prayer and he, says, he sends an angel. Why did he send this messenger? Why did he give him this vision? Why did he do that? Was it to tell Cornelius, you're saved? No. That's not why the angel came. That's not why he had that vision. You know, you think about the description we're talking about here with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Who, who this man is, most people read that about this man, what would they say in the world today? He's a good man. Not only is he a good man, but I couldn't see anybody that was like that going to hell. He just has, he just has such a great character. 
Look at how many good things He does for the people around Him. Yet God sends an angel. He sends a vision and He says, I need you to send for someone. God doesn't just say, and you've been doing so great lately, I'm going to just go ahead and save you. Amen. You are forgiven of your sins. Just because he saw an angel didn't mean that he was forgiven of his sins. But what does God do? He says there's someone that you do need to listen to. Someone who will bring you the message of salvation. And like Cornelius, all are lost without the gospel. Every single person is lost. All have fallen short of the glory of God. The gospel is God's power to save. He doesn't send angels to save people. He doesn't give you a vision to save you. His gospel message, if you will hear it, believe it, and obey it, is what saves you. The gospel, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, is the power of God for salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. To the person who realizes that they are lost. They are going to seek. And they're going to search. If they understand their lost condition before God, the gospel is the most sought after thing in the world. It is the one thing that that can save your soul. That's Cornelius. But what about Peter? Oh, Peter. One of the, one of the greatest disciples. We, we learn so much about Peter in the gospel accounts, and we, we see him do so many things. We see him insert his foot into his mouth a number of times. He does things that he shouldn't do, but he does it all out of, out of zealousness. He's got the zeal. He's ready to work. He's ready to do things. Jesus, I love you. I'll, I'll die for you. And whoa, whoa. I denied him three times. Peter struggled, but he's, he's a picture of us too, where we, we love God and we want to do the right things and, and we're all out there and then all of a sudden we miss up and we, oh, and we shrink up. But Peter is, has gotten over that and he's, he's preached that sermon at Pentecost and he tells the Jews what they need to do to be saved and he tells, he tells them that it's not just you, but your descendants and the Gentiles, all who are far off. But there's not really a whole lot of Gentiles in the church yet. And here in Acts chapter 10, Peter receives a vision too of this great sheep that comes down and it's got all kinds of animals on it, four-footed animals, creeping and crawling creatures on the earth, birds of the air. And a voice calls out to him in verse 13, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times. And immediately the object was taken up into the sky. And when you read verse 17, now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind. Now, I would be too. I, you know, I'd, I'd be sitting there going, what was that all about? Does God want me to just eat some different animals, and do I need to change my diet? Have I been putting on weight? What does this mean for me? And so he's greatly perplexed by this, but then the people that were sent by Cornelius come, and and he meets them, and they tell him about Cornelius, and they eventually go to meet him. But Peter has his own vision. He gets summoned by those who uh, who are the messengers of Cornelius, but the application of this vision for Peter was something that he didn't realize until he went to meet with Cornelius. He didn't gain the understanding until he finally got there. Cornelius, when he meets him, bows down to worship Peter. All Cornelius knows is, I've got this vision from an angel. I was told to get you, and now you've come to my house, and If if you're a messenger of God, I don't know what else to do but to just simply fall before you and worship you. And then Peter, of course, 
rebukes him in verse 26. Peter raised him up saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. Just a man. In verse 28, it says this. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Peter gets it. He recognizes what needs to happen here. Now that he's there, now that he's been summoned, now that he's come into contact with Cornelius, I finally get it. What was unclean before, what I wasn't associating with before, God says, it's clean. Go seek them out. They need to hear the gospel message. Peter asks him, so why, for what reason, in verse 29, have you sent for me? That's a great question to ask, by the way. When someone calls you into their office, when someone has a meeting plan, they, they want to talk to you, and you go to their house, and it's, well, why did you call me here? For what reason did you ask me to come? Because sometimes you're thinking all kinds of different things in your mind. As you're driving, as you're going, as you're walking, you're getting nervous, you're starting to sweat bullets, you don't know why you're going there, why did they ask me to come in? The best thing to do is simply ask. Why, why, why did you call me here? What am I here for? And so Cornelius explains to him, verse 30, Four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Why are you here this morning? Have you come to worship God? To sing praises to God? To bow before Him? To pray? To give? To partake of the Lord's Supper? Have you come to hear what God's Word has to say? Here is Cornelius saying to Peter, we are all here before you right now to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. What preacher doesn't want to hear those words? I'm here to listen to what God's Word says. I'm here to listen to what God wants me to do. What about us? Have we come to hear what God's Word wants us to do? What God desires for us to do? And then, of course, after this moment, the Gospel is presented to Cornelius and his household. Verse 34, specifically, Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. And at this moment, Peter begins to preach and proclaim the gospel message. God is not one to show partiality. And he proclaims Jesus to them. And before he even finishes talking about everything, the Holy Spirit comes down to them. And they are baptized. These Gentiles are baptized, immersed in the Holy Spirit. Just as the apostles were in Acts chapter 2. After that, Peter says, who can deny them to be baptized? But here's the gospel message. That Jesus is the Christ. That He is God's anointed one. That He is the Lord of peace. He's the Lord of power. He's the Lord of purpose. He's the Lord of salvation. He's the anointed Savior. He's a slain 
Savior. He's a risen Savior. He's the one that has been revealed. He's the one that has been ascended into heaven. And He's come and He's done all this to cleanse you. To make you clean. Not just because you're a Gentile. That has nothing to do with it. But to cleanse you of your sins. And the one who hears His words and believes in Him will have everlasting life. But you have to believe it. And you need to be baptized into Him by His authority, into His name, into His death, into His burial, and into His resurrection. Peter proclaims all these things to them. But you want to know what happens next? You would think, man, this is, this is one of the greatest stories ever. Peter overcomes his, his partiality the fact that he's He's been struggling with going to the Gentiles. He's overcome that. And and they hear Him and they obey it. And the Holy Spirit is poured out just like what was promised. And they're baptized and they're saved. And and let's just go start singing and dancing. Hallelujah, right? But then Acts chapter 11 comes. What do we see in verses 1 through 3? Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. So not only do we see that the gospel is sought after by the Gentiles and that that the gospel is brought by Peter and, and through that vision that he's told to go and the Spirit tells him to go, but we also see that The gospel is fought against. And it's not fought against by those that don't believe. It's fought against those that are already a part of the church. It's fought against the Jews that had already obeyed the gospel. They are now Christians. But they're fighting against the gospel message, the message that God has desired them to proclaim to all creation. To all people, to all nations. And they begin to fight against it. And by the way, even Peter continues to struggle with this. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul talks about the fact that he had to oppose Peter. That he had to tell Peter, what, what are you doing? Ignoring the Gentiles over here and only eating with the Jews. Do you not see what you're doing because of your example All the Jews are separating from the Gentiles and it's causing more division. Even Peter struggles with this later on. But in this moment, in Acts chapter 11, Peter gives one of the greatest defenses to this accusation by those in Judea. By the way, one of the best defenses you can have is the truth. Not only to have the truth on your side, but for you to simply tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so Peter tells them the truth. That he had a vision. That, he, that these messengers came. And that what he understood that vision to mean is that what God has cleansed, I can't call unclean anymore. But not only that, but they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we received. And how could I deny them if if God approves of them? Who am I? Who am I to not share the gospel with them? And so they were baptized in water. It reminds me of Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28, where Paul says, For you are all sons of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so then, at the end of this defense, they all accept what Peter says and begin to glorify God. Acts chapter 11, verse 18. When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, 
God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. What we need to understand is that there is partiality. There's partiality in this world. We see it in all different venues, in all different ways. But sometimes we too show partiality. Even though we know the gospel message is for all. We sing a song, right? The gospel is for all. And we'll sing it proudly. We love that song. We want to hear those words. But are we showing any partiality? <clears throat> are we not sharing the gospel with those that we might have an issue with? And I don't mean that we have an issue because we dislike them or that we hate them necessarily. Certainly with the Jews and Gentiles, there was a great degree of enmity. There's a great degree of hate. You know, partiality doesn't have to be because I truly hate someone or dislike them to that degree. Partiality can come about with the fact that I just noticed some differences about you that are different from me. And I can be slightly uncomfortable with it. For instance, someone who is deaf. I'm not sure how to communicate with you. I haven't learned sign language. I haven't done that. and It'll just be easier for me to not even try. Or someone who is blind and can't see. I've never experienced that. I don't know what kind of struggles you're going through. I'm not sure exactly how to talk to you about those things. And so it's easier for me to just not say anything. Someone who might be handicapped in some physical way. Where I've never experienced that in my life. I've been perfectly healthy for the 36 years that I've been alive. I don't know what to say and I don't know what to do. And so it's easier for me to be partial and just not say anything. It's easier for me to go to talk to the person that looks like me, that walks like me, that talks like me. <coughs> I might be partial because you don't look like me. You don't dress like me. I wear a suit and a tie on Sunday mornings. Well, you're not wearing a suit and a tie. I'm a little uncomfortable. Not sure how to talk to you. We can show partiality in all kinds of different ways. Just because your skin is a different color from mine. Amen. Amen. Just because, well, I mean, I have a six-figure income, and you don't. I don't know how I can associate with someone like you. I mean, I put work and effort into everything that I do. It looks like you don't even care about how you live, and look at the way you dress. We show partiality in all kinds of ways. The gospel is for all. Peter finally realized here in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11 that God wants to save all people. It's not that Peter didn't know it. Jesus had proclaimed it multiple times. Jesus had taught him that. It's not that Peter didn't know it. He was just still stuck in the Jewish tradition of things. And he was unable to break out of that on his own. And so God helped him, helped push him along. Are you showing partiality in your life as a Christian? Are you unwilling to share the gospel message to your friends, to your neighbors, to your loved ones, to someone you just met. Because, well, I, I don't know, I mean, I like them okay, but I don't think 
they'll fit in with the church very well. So I just won't bother. And we start to show partiality. Right. God sent Peter to bring the gospel message to a Gentile named Cornelius. Cornelius and his household gratefully and happily obeyed the gospel. What about you? The gospel is for all, and that means it's for you. If you desire salvation, if you desire to be reconciled not only to God, but to His children, to His people, that opportunity is for you today. But for those of us that are here, for those of us that are listening online at home, if you are not sharing the gospel because you're showing some sort of partiality, how do you think God is looking at you? The gospel is for all. And by the way, God sees all. He knows what you're doing, whether you're sinning or whether you're not sharing the gospel. Yes. Let's not show any partiality. Any partiality. Let's share the gospel with any and everyone who will listen. Just like Cornelius, he said, we are here to listen to what the Lord has commanded you. Anyone that's willing to listen to these words that we can sit down with, we need to sit down with them. doesn't matter who they are. We need to share the message of salvation, the message of Jesus Christ with them. If you need to come forward this morning to repent, to ask for prayers, to obey the gospel, the opportunity is now for you as we stand and sing. There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by.